So uh, we've been on an unofficial series, um, kind of series, kind of not. Um, but we're following the same theme or the same uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, lane, so to speak. And we've been talking for several weeks, uh, is he Lord uh, or Lord, was last week. In other words, is he your Lord in title only, or is he Lord of your life in position? Um, the week before we talked about, is he Lord or is he Savior? Um, Savior is what he does, Lord is who he is. He cannot do what he does until you acknowledge and allow him to be who he is. Uh, and that's where a lot of believers get it wrong. Uh, they believe that they can accept him only by title, but never allow him to be who he is by position, uh, but they want to receive everything that he has to give. And that's where we make a big mistake. He only gives when he is who he is. So I hope that's clear. We hammered that uh, for just uh, two or three weeks on and off. Uh, so today our title is Gold Digger. And everybody, I think everybody in this room knows what a gold digger is, correct? Uh, look, 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 look over, if you're married, look over at your mate and say, don't worry, it's not you, okay? Uh, say, don't, don't, don't be getting upset at me, it's not you. Uh, but we all know what a gold digger is. A gold digger uh, can be a guy, it can be a woman. Typically, when we say gold digger, it's in reference to a female um, who is attracted, she's attracted to a man uh, for what he has, for what he can give her. Usually she's attracted to his wealth or his status or whatever it is. And a lot of guys, especially when they get older, um, they don't mind having a gold digger attracted to the, them because they get something out of it too. I mean, they have arm candy. Uh, of course, they're a little older. It says to the world, I still have it. I still got my swag uh, because I've got this girl 30 years younger than me that, that's just attracted to me. So for whatever reason, it doesn't mean that everybody that has a great age difference and that fall in love, that there, there is a gold digger situation going on. Some people just fall in love and their ages are a little bit different and that's okay too. But as I watch the videos, quite honestly, trying to pick one, uh, and they're all, they're all filmed around the LA area, I was amazed. I mean, if you go on uh, YouTube, you'll find just a million of them out there. It seems like everybody is running the gold digger prank. And, uh, and, and it is absolutely comical, but at the same time, it's a little bit depressing to see how shallow people are. I mean, to see one video right after another, a guy comes up and says, hey man, you want to have a cup of coffee? And, and, and the girl goes, no, nah, are you kidding? I'm married. I got a boyfriend. I got a, oh, that's my phone ringing right now. He's calling me. We're meeting up. Uh, goodbye. And turn around and he drives up in the car and you can see the car and then all of a sudden they want to go out. Oh, I don't have a boyfriend. I just dumped him. Uh, can we, we, yeah, I'm free. Well, you weren't free a minute ago, but now you're free. And it's amazing that the, there is no feelings for the person, only for what they have. And can I get a piece of that? Now, now, we ask ourselves, how does that relate to our relationship with God? Because I believe that there are believers that come to the Lord, uh, but have a gold digger mentality. They only, they only, they're only interested in what they can extract from God. They're only interested in what they can get. It has nothing to do with relationship. It has nothing to do with love and intimacy or any of those things. It's simply, what can I get out of this? What, what can it make me feel good? And I wrote a couple of things down. The first thing I want to look at is it all starts with your GPS. It all starts with your GPS because whatever you have your GPS set on is where you're going to go. If I have my GPS set on the mall, but I need to go to the airport to catch a flight, how many of you know that the GPS is only going to direct me to the mall? And if I go past the mall and I dare to get on the freeway, that thing from here to Oakland will drive me crazy because it will repeatedly say, at the next exit, get off and make a U-turn. You're going the wrong way. Go back. The mall is that way. 
So it all starts with a GPS, and you have to ask yourself, what is your GPS? What, what, what is important to you? What, what is the most important thing in your life? What is your GPS set on? Everybody here has a GPS that, that directs them and that drives them. And it's interesting that as I looked at the New Testament, I said, let me figure out what the Apostle Paul's GPS was. Let me see what his GPS, what it was set on. And he says to the Philippian church in chapter 3 and verse 14, he says, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call. He said, that's my GPS. I have, I have one destination. It is singular. I'm not diverting to the left or to the right. I'm not taking any side trips. I have one destination, and that is I press on. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call. That's my GPS. Everything in my life centers around that. That's where I'm going. And as you look at the life of Paul, you see that there were many, many, many distractions. There was distractions by the way of, uh, of people and, and false teachers. There was distractions by churches that he was trying to pastor. There was distractions in the way of obstacles and, and things that buffeted him, the Bible says. And he says, man, I'm getting it every day. Every day things are happening to me. But it's like the song that Kenny led, that even when things are bad and things are not going right, we lift up and we begin to praise, even at those times. And Paul was saying, my GPS is so set that it doesn't matter what happens to me. My GPS is set on one thing and only one thing, and that's where I'm going to go. Now, there are a lot of things that you can set your GPS on. Not everything that you would set it on is bad. Not everything is evil. You can set your GPS on some pretty good things. But the, the question you have to ask yourself, is it good or is it God? Good isn't, that was our first message about three weeks or four weeks ago, not everything that is good is God. It can be good, but it doesn't mean that it is God. If it's, let's take, for instance, we looked last week at the rich young ruler. The rich young ruler had his GPS set on some good things. In fact, Jesus asked, Jesus quoted the sixth through the tenth commandment, and, and the rich young ruler said, all of those things I've done. All of those things I'm good at. I, I treat my family right. I respect my mother and father. And maybe his GPS was to gain wealth. That's not a bad thing. It was to do well. It was to be somebody. That, those are not bad. But the problem is, is his GPS was just off enough that it didn't center on God. All of those things became a God to him. He no longer had room for God, God. So his GPS was off, and Jesus said to him, this one thing you lack. You're lacking something. Let me tell you what it is. But he, his GPS was so set on the not so good, on the not God, that he couldn't receive what Jesus said, and the Bible said he walked off discouraged. He's probably in hell today. So even though your GPS could be set on some good things, it doesn't mean it's set on the right thing. So somebody said, well, 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 well maybe my GPS, I'm going to give all of my stuff to the poor. I I'm going to sell everything, and I'm going to give it to the poor. I'm going to be the opposite of the young rich guy. He wouldn't sell anything. He wanted to keep it because it became his God. So I'm going to do the opposite. I've got this figured out. I'm going to set my GPS, and I'm going to get rid of everything in my closet. I'm going to dump all my furniture on somebody that needs some furniture. Uh, I'm going to sell my house, and I'm going to take the money, and I'm going to drive down Tabor Avenue, giving everybody $100 bills that look like they need them. And then at the very end, I'll have nothing, and I, that's where my GPS is going. And, and God will look at me, and God will say, well done, uh, you good and faithful servant, and uh, you're the opposite of the young rich guy. And, but how many of you know that that GPS can be wrong? As good as it sounds... 
as well intended as it might be, the GPS is off. Because Paul says, he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 3, he says, if I, if, if, if I give all I possess to the poor and I give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but I do not have love, I gain absolutely nothing. I gain nothing. It's, it's for nothing. I did it for nothing. Give me my stuff back. I gave it away, I get nothing out of it. I want it back now. At least I got my stuff, right? It's for nothing. So even as good as that sounds, the GPS is off. Just enough. Well, 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 I was thinking about the disciples and, and I was thinking about Judas. You know, we like to, we like to cap on Judas Iscariot and we like to say he's the man that sold out Christ. <clears throat> But his GPS was off. But do you know that Judas, remember a couple of things, Jesus picked him. He picked 12. He picked 12 men that he saw something in them that he could nurture. Jesus picked Judas. He was one of the 12. Judas did everything that the other disciples did. Judas prayed and healed the sick. Judas preached the gospel when they were sent out. Judas did miracles along with the other disciples. He was there when the 5,000 were fed with, the, with a few loaves and two fish. He was there passing the basket out with everybody else. Judas professed his love to Jesus Christ. Judas gave to the poor like the other disciples. And when Peter said to Jesus, we've left everything to follow you, Judas was right there going, me too. Me too. But something was off in his GPS, and today Judas is in hell. He followed Christ. He was picked by Christ. He did everything the other disciples did. But something was off. Jesus even had a parable about it. Jesus said, there will be those that say, haven't we prophesied in your name? Haven't we healed in your name? Haven't we cast out demons in your name? We've done all these great things, Lord. And he will say to them, depart from me, I never knew you. Get away from me, I never knew you. I only know those who make me Lord. And though you used my name and you did all those good things, I never knew you. I was never your Lord. Depart from me. So their GPS is off. Don't be fooled when you think the GPS only means doing good things. Well, it's all about having, doing good things. I mean, I, I could do some stuff today that I could walk out of here and you all would clap and, and go, wow, wasn't that tremendous? Look what Pastor Scott did. He, he, he just gave away all his stuff. Look what he did. But that doesn't impress God. God isn't impressed with what you do. On your best day, remember the Bible says, on your best day, your righteousness is, as, is like filthy rags. On your best day. Imagine what it's like on your bad days. God isn't impressed with what you do. God is only impressed with who you make his son in your life. That's the only thing that impresses God. In fact, that's the very thing that you and I get judged on when we stand before him. He isn't going to say, Scott, what did you do and how many times did you preach and, 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 and how many years were... He's not even going to ask that. He does not care. He's going to say, who was my son in your life? And I'm going to be able to say he was Lord in my life. And he's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. Come and inherit what I have for you. <clears throat> I found something interesting when it came to Moses, something that I hadn't taken into consideration before. The key to Moses' life, when God said, I will meet with you face to face and we will talk 
face to face. Moses is the only individual that God did that with. There was something about Moses that I, 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 I realized, and it is this. Moses had his GPS right. And out of anybody that could have had GPS out of tilt, it would have been Moses, but he had it right. He had it spot on. Y'all remember the story that he was an Israelite and Pharaoh had ordered all of the babies to be killed, the male babies, and his mother put them in a basket and sent them down the Nile. And Pharaoh's daughter came out, saw him, fell in love with him, took him home to be her own son. Now, some things that you may or may not know, at this time period, Egypt is one of the wealthiest nations on the planet. Becoming Pharaoh's son, many scholars believe that he was next in line to be Pharaoh. He had no other brothers before him, that he actually was the next Pharaoh. That tells you that there was nobody in Egypt with a higher status than his. He is under Pharaoh, second under Pharaoh, in the wealthiest nation in the world. There is nothing that he cannot have. He has the best of the best. There is nothing that he could ever want for. It is all there for him. He blinks and they will kill you. You offend him. You take his parking place and he can't put his chariot there. They will take you and kill you. He is the most powerful man in Egypt outside of Pharaoh. But he did not allow that to determine his GPS. In fact, Hebrews chapter 11 says it this way. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, he refused to be known as Pharaoh, he refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He refused to be known as her son. In other words, he refused to accept the status that Egypt had. And he chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ, or he was regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. Now, now stop for a minute and think for a minute. He was looking ahead to his reward. On one hand, he had everything a man could want. You, you would think that you would put your GPS somewhere right in there. You, you would think that maybe his GPS would be, I'm going to be the best leader I can be for Egypt. I, I'm going to try to reach out and have my, my, my relatives uh, by birth uh, uh, have them set free. He could have put his GPS anywhere in there, but he refused all of that, and he decided it was better to suffer disgrace for Christ in order to obtain the great reward. Now, if I were to do by a show of hands, how many of you would think the great reward was the promised land to Moses? Most of you would say yes. But the great reward to Moses was not the promised land. In fact, at this time, he didn't know of a promised land. He was clueless to God's delivering his people out of Egypt. There was no promised land to know. When Moses has an encounter with God because of where he said, let me tell you this, if your GPS is set on God, you will always have an encounter with God. You cannot have a GPS set on God without God meeting you someplace. 
He has an encounter with God, and God said, I want you to go to Pharaoh, and I want you to tell him to let my people go. When God sends him to Pharaoh and says, let my people go, God never mentions promised land. God never said, let my people go so that I can bring them into the promised land. What God does say is let my people go so they can worship me in the wilderness. No mention of promised land. Let my people go so they can worship me in the wilderness. In fact, Moses goes before Pharaoh and he says that seven times. Let my people go, God said, Pharaoh, God said, let my people go so that they can worship me in the wilderness. If he would have said, so they can come to the promised land, that would have meant nothing to Moses. The promised land, flowing with milk and honey, does not offer anything that Egypt didn't already have. Remember, Moses gave up the wealth of Egypt. Moses decided it would be better to go live in the desert. He gave up the wealth of Egypt. There was nothing the promised land could offer him that Egypt didn't already have. Milk and honey, Egypt had milk and honey. Wealth untold, Egypt had wealth untold. The best delicacies, Egypt had that too. So the promised land isn't what attracted Moses. In fact, when God is delivering his people, it isn't even mentioned. It's not mentioned. Relationship is the only thing that's mentioned. God said, so they can worship me in the wilderness. Why are you here today? What is your GPS set on today? See, only you can answer that. If it's relationship and an encounter with God, you're going to get it. If it's, if it's only what God can do for you, if it's your promised land that you're looking for, your GPS is off. Then you may look for that for a long time. It's only after they come out of Egypt to worship in the wilderness does God even mention promised land. See, somehow we got the cart before the horse, haven't we? Somehow it's nothing to do, it's nothing about a relationship with God. It's all about what I'm going to get. Let me tell you, I'll just be honest with you. So worship starting this morning, and uh, our drummer's not here. So Kenny's a fantastic guitarist, so we boosted up her acoustic guitar to try to compensate. And LT's bass, we jacked him up sound-wise to kind of carry a beat. Um, but the first song, I'm sitting there going, man, where's our drummer? We need horns. We need electric guitars. We, you know, we need keyboard. And uh, I actually had this thought. I actually had this thought. I said, in fact, in fact I said it to God. I said, God, God, that, why is it that we have such a problem with not being able to retain a drummer? I said, this sucks. Nobody's going to come to church. If they come to church, they'll never come back. All the other churches have drummers. How come we don't have a drummer, God? All the other churches have keyboard players. I mean, I mean, I won't, I won't stretch. I'd like to have a, a harmonica up here on a mic. I mean, I mean, I mean, let's let's get down, you know. I mean, how? I, but I won't even ask for that. Just give us a drummer once in a while, you know. I had those thoughts. Nobody's going to come. What was my assumption that everybody comes for the show? They're not really coming for God. 
But what did God do when he saw your heart? Because I looked, I looked around, there are people worshiping, no drummer, but they're worshiping. And I thought, now that is really something. People are worshiping God at a time when our music is the weakest. But they're worshiping God. God's, God saw the GPS and God showed up and spoke. I wonder if God would speak more often if when we came, we came with the right GPS. If that, I was standing there thinking, I was thinking about times when I first became a Christian and, and I was thinking about our worship services and, and our worship services were almost exclusively led by a guitar, an unmiked acoustic guitar. And we had worship services like you don't see in church today. In fact, we had worship services that went on so long that the speaker would say, I'm not even going to share today. We're just going to have an encounter with God, and we're going to worship. And God would start touching people, and they, some would fall out, some would jump up and down, some would cry, some would have revelation. I mean, and unbelievable as God would walk through the aisles touching people. Prophetic words would come out from different ones. People would be healed right in their seat. Unbelievable. But we came to meet with God. We didn't come to, to make me feel good. We didn't come to say, I bet the lights better be right. We better have the right musicians and they better have a, a real cool beat and, and you know, going, a uh, good vibe. We didn't come for any of that. We, we, there was none of that. We, we didn't even have comfortable chairs like you all do. Most of us sat on the floor. In fact, we packed the building out. There were no chairs. We'd all sit on the floor just about. We'd sit on the platform. We'd just sardines and worship God. Let me read to you from Exodus chapter 33. Exodus chapter 33, and I'm going to read verse 1 through 3, and I'm going to drop to verse 15. It says, And the Lord said to Moses, Leave this place, you and the people you brought up out of Egypt, and go to the land I promised on an oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants, and I will send an angel before you, and drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Go to the land flowing with milk and honey. But listen to this. But I will not go with you because you are stiff-necked people and I might destroy you on the way. I won't go with you. I, I, I'm, I'm going to send an angel to take you there, but I won't go with you. It's the only time in the Bible that God said, I won't be there. I will not go with you. Now, most of us would think that Moses would have said, well, okay, as long as your angel's going to represent, we're good with that. And we're just going to go because you promised it to us and you're fulfilling your promise and we're going to go. But when you drop down to verse 15, it's at verse 15 you see Moses' GPS in play. Then Moses said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. One of the translations says it this way. Moses said to God, if you are not going with me, then I am not going. I'm staying right where you're at. If you're not going, as good as it looks, that's not where my GPS is set on. My GPS is set on being in your presence. So if you're not going, I'm not going. I'll stay right here in the wilderness eating manna 
day in and day night. In fact, that's all they ate was manna. And I'll be content right here in the wilderness for the rest of my life as long as your presence is here. I wonder how many believers would say that. I wonder how many believers, if God stopped blessing you and there were no more blessings in your life, you lived in the most ratty place with the most ratty neighbors, you ate ratty food, but God's presence was there. I, I wonder how many people would actually be content and say, God, I, I don't require anything else but your presence. It, this is enough. And, 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 and if God blesses, then great, but there's not a complaint coming out of my mouth. I, I wonder how many of us would do that. I wonder, I wonder how many times we just complain, complain, complain because we don't think God is giving us what we want or deserve. I wonder how many times, just speaking personally, my GPS is set on everything outside of his presence. You know how you know if that's true? You know it in my life by how I start my day. Because if I start my day in any way other than focused on God and spending time with him, you know my GPS is off for the day. My GPS is telling me all the things I got to do to be a somebody and a something and have people look and think I got the job done right. And I forgot the most important thing. Moses said, your presence is the most important. So much so that if I have to stay right here, I will stay right here. I will not go in the promised land. I'll stay right here because you ain't going to get me to leave your presence for love, no money. It's interesting because Moses goes from those encounters to be invited by God up a mountain to meet with God face to face for 40 days. So much so that when he comes down from the mountain, the children of Israel say, you've got to put a veil over your face because you're glowing. He has encounter after encounter after encounter with God. When your GPS is right, God will always be there. But if your GPS is not right, don't look for him. You can't have a desire for God's presence and not have him there. It is impossible. Moses' GPS was right. I'm going to take you to Exodus. We're going to drop back into the 19th chapter for a minute. Going along with the prophetic word, song, and word this morning. Take you to Exodus chapter 19. We're going to read verse 4, 10 and 11, and the 16 through 18. Chapter 19 and verse 4. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. God brought the children of Israel out of Egypt to worship in the wilderness. And here he's saying, I brought you out to myself. Nothing else. I brought you out to myself. I want you. I love you. I want you to myself. Then we drop down to verse 10 and verse 11. And the Lord said to Moses, go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. Have them wash their clothes and be ready by the third day because on that day, the Lord will come down. I'm coming down. I'm coming down from the mountain. I am coming down from Mount Sinai in the sight of all people. I'm coming down to meet with them. Can you imagine that? God's coming down 
to meet with them, the children of Israel. He brings them out of Egypt to worship him in the wilderness. He says, I brought you out to, for myself and, and get ready, get ready. Tomorrow at 9 a.m. I'm coming down to meet with you physically. Pretty awesome. Verse 16. Verse 16. On the morning of the third day, God's coming down. There was thunder, lightning, and a thick, with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp trembled. Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up from, uh, this, from it like smoke from a furnace, and the whole mountain trembled violently, and the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder. Then Moses spoke, and the voice of God answered him. They're having an unbelievable encounter with God. Physically. Physically, they're seeing this, physically. But it's interesting because when you go to chapter 20, chapter 20, verse 18, this is how they respond. And when the people saw the thunder and the lightning, lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain and smoke, they trembled with fear and they stayed at a distance. They stayed at a distance. You would think that they would come running to meet God. But they stayed at a distance. And they said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we will listen. But do not have God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you and to keep you from sinning. But the people remained at a distance while Moses approached the thick darkness where God was. The people remained at a distance while Moses approached God. Are you getting that picture? God tells them, I brought you out of Egypt to worship me in the wilderness. God says, I carried you out symbolically on wings to bring you to myself. Now that I've got your attention, he says, I'm now going to meet with you. You are my people and I'm going to meet with you face to face. So on the third day, get ready. Get ready, because we're going to have an encounter. To which the people say, we don't want to meet with you. We, we really don't want to meet with you. You, 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 you. you talk to Moses and let Moses talk to us. We don't really want to meet with you. We, we, we want a relationship with you through Moses. We don't want to hear from you direct. We just want to hear from Moses. You talk to him, and we'll do whatever Moses says. But give us the promised land. We do want that. We, we still want to go get the promised land. I mean, after all, you promised that to us, but, but we don't want to have anything to do with you. We'll do it through Moses. You know, the, the, the horrible thing today is that's happening in churches all over America today. I want my relationship with God to only come by way of the pastor. The, my, my, my relationship with God is only what happens on Sunday morning. That's all I want. I want 
I want the worship to be good and I want to feel a little tingly. And then I want a really good message that's going to really kind of don't hurt me too bad because I still want the promised land. It just hurt me a little bit. That'll be okay. But tell me what I'm going to get. And, and that's really all I want out of this relationship. Well, well God, you, 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 we, Moses, we want God to speak to you. And then you, you talk to us and that's okay. God doesn't want to speak to just Moses. God wants to speak to you. That only happens, though, when your GPS is right. Now, they did go in and, and, and obtain the promised land through some great leadership. Moses did not go. It's interesting, when God said to him, you cannot go, I'll let you see it. Takes him up on a mountain and says, I'll let you see it, but you cannot go. Moses never complained about it because that wasn't where his heart was at anyway. I always thought Moses would have had a meltdown and cried, oh God, 40 years I've been out here with these people, at least let me go in. He doesn't care because he has what he wants. He has what his GPS has been set on all along. He didn't give a hoot about the promised land. He never talked about it. And when God said, you ain't going to go, I'm going to take you home, he never complained not one time. He's like, man, it's good with me. Let them have it. I don't care. But they all wanted it. They had to have it. They, had, they went in. They fought other nations for it. I mean, they had a horrendous time possessing it. But they did through the grace of God. I wonder if when God came down, if they would have embraced his presence, I wonder if they had marched into the promised land without a battle because God would have gone before them and fought every enemy and annihilated all of their enemies and they'd have walked in without one battle. But as it turned out, they kind of went at it with his blessing and his, and, and his help, but they had to fight their own battles. If you make God the center of your, your, your life, your GPS, and that's your focus, his presence, I wonder how many things in your life God will deal with sovereignly without your involvement at all. I faced a situation the other day I was a little bit, a little bit concerned. I was worried, and I, I before I came here, I said, "God, this is not going to go well. Police are going to be called. I'm going to get threatened. This is not going down really well. I can see this happening. I don't know how. I just not something I want to deal with today." And as I prayed, I said, "I know my GPS is right." And I'm going to ask you to intervene in this situation and do something that would be totally abnormal. And I left it at that. So we walked in. We had this little meeting. And the gentleman said to me, he said, I was there with Robert. And the gentleman said, I fully understand. Excuse me. I have no problem with this. I agree with your decision. Excuse me again. I'm happy to go. You've done nothing but good by me. I love you guys to death. I respect you immensely. And I walked from that meeting going, what just happened? There was no police call, not one threat. I tell you that only to say that when you make God your center, as a parent, if my kids make me their center, you better get out of their way. Plain and simple. Nobody will hurt them. But if they ignore dad 
and they decide dad's not that important, they're going to go do what they want to do, well, I'm going to kind of let them just do that. We're going to deal with a subject in a couple of weeks. We're out of time. I'm not even going to really launch into it today, but I'll give you just a little taste. The Bible talks about the promised land as the place of rest. I was sharing with Mama Linda the other day, and John talks about another place of rest beyond the promised land. And he says, if it would have been fulfilled in the promised land, God would not have spoke about it as a second place of rest. There is a place in his presence that you can go and everything in your life that doesn't mean that there won't be obstacles, but you're in a place of supernatural heavenly rest. I read that and I thought, where have I been for all of these years that I followed God? That became a revelation to me. And I, I read that and read that and read that and read that. And I said, oh my gosh, I have been living life outside of that realm of rest. And it's promised to me in your presence. In your presence, I go into another realm of rest. Has nothing to do with the promised land at all. I said, what is wrong with me? I've lived all my life outside of that. It's about time. I'm going to take the few years I have left. I I'm entering into that realm of rest. But it comes only by way of his presence. So I recalibrated my GPS. The presence of God is the most important thing in my life. Because when that's right, everything else is right. So I'm challenging you today that if your GPS is off a little bit, put in a new address and recalibrate it so you're going the right way with the right focus and the right destination. Amen?